Hey traders, welcome to another global macro update. This video is going to be a little bit different. We got one news topic or one subject to talk about within the news, and then we're going to go over mainly uh, just the S&P 500. This is the SPX, which is uh, the index for the S&P 500, which is the largest 500 companies in the United States. And we're going to go over the dot com bust, which is right here from 2000 to kind of end of 2002. And then we're also going to go over the financial crisis of 2008 that ended a uh, little bit after the end of 2009 at the bottom of around March. And then we're going to extrapolate what we can gather for quality, useful information within these two charts. And then we're going to go into what we currently see right now happening and then what we could be potentially looking for for a high probability situation for a short to capture some uh, percentages to the downside here. So uh, first things first, I do quickly want to just talk about uh, one thing involving FIBS. We are going to be using FIBS for this analysis. Uh, if you have no idea what FIBS are, uh, Fibonacci retracement levels, uh, there is a bunch of stuff online or you can just go in our Discord and ask one of our teammates as well. But uh, basically what we're going to be using is a FIB retracement level of 50% and 618. So it's going to be one is 50% retracement and another one is 61.8. And these are going to be key, key numbers, especially 61.8 within the FIB retracement levels that we're going to be working with. So in a market, what happens when it's in a downtrend or uptrend, you're making a series of lower lows and lower highs or higher highs and higher lows, right? But then we're looking for a bearish move because of the bear market. We're looking for the series of lower, lower highs and lower lows. Looking at dot com boom and 2008 we see three major moves actually this is probably not the best way to do it uh we see uh the first move very strong and then you see a pullback and then you see another move and then you see like the end capitulation and then you start to see some basing so what we're going to be using is the uh, fib retracements looking at the second leg and third leg so we got uh, three legs, you'll understand this once we actually dive into the charts, but there are three legs. From this point here to this point here is our first leg. From the lower, major lower high to the next lower low is the second leg. And then we get one more pullback, again lower high, and then you get a lower low as the third leg. So in total, uh, we're looking at three major pushes to the downside. Let's get this red. And we've already seen this one. This one, we don't have to trade. This one is going to be the signal that, holy shit, we're in a bear market. That was a major push to the downside. We're going to get some level of a pullback. And when we see that right here, there's going to be stimulus. There's going to be buyers buying the dip because it's happened before. Look at 2018, massive push to the downside right after Christmas. It rallied right back up all the way through 2019. It was a phenomenal year for the stock market. So it's happened before, and this is our first major dump so there's going to be a lot of people looking to buy you see it on social media oh my god airlines are such a good buy because of uh the price it's it's down 85 percent, so it must be a good buy and, and there's a lot of people who are looking to enter because this has happened before we're gonna get our pullback right now within the pullback these are gonna be what we're gonna be looking for but we're not gonna talk about them just yet what we're going to try to capture for us as shorter term swing traders, day traders, as active market participants, we're going to be looking to make money on the second leg and third leg. We do not need to trade this. We only need to understand when this is coming in. And obviously in this bear market, very easy to understand because we've really had such an aggressive move to the downside, but we don't need to trade the first leg. We'll go into 2001 and 2008 and understand why the second leg and third leg will give us a higher probability situation that we don't have to uh, the first leg is going to be the hardest to identify basically. And once you get that momentum, once you get the fundamentals to kick in, it's not uh, as difficult understanding where the weakness lies for the bulls and then when the transfer from the demand to supply will come in. So now that we understand the basics of what we're trying to capture, 
the next question is, okay, how do we understand this pullback? When's a good time to enter? A stock is going up, an ETF is going up. How do you know when it's gonna go to the downside? If you're short, it could just continue going up, right? So how do you know? So we use a two system approach here. First one is actually looking at the FIB levels. We'll talk about that when we get into the charts. And then we also look at ascending zones. Let's get our line. We look for ascending zones of support where we see the price making a series of higher lows and when that breaks to the downside, that is going to signal for us that there's potentially going to be a shift in trend. This along with simple market structure, series of lower lows and lower highs or consolidation or higher lows and higher highs and also looking at the fibs. And that's how we're going to identify this potential reversal that we're going to see after the completion of the first pullback, which we're currently at right now. So. What we're looking for is the 50% to 61.8. What does that mean? So what a FIB retracement is, is from this point here to this point here. If the price comes and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a key high and a key low, a major swing high and a major swing low, right? So that's the push to the downside. We're looking for a retracement back to the upside before our next leg down. So what this 50% means is from the low here to the high, if it gets to half, it's gonna be 50%, right? Because it's 50% retracement to the top. So let's say it dropped, you know, a certain amount and if it went halfway to the top, well then that's a 50% retracement level and that would be a key FIB level that we'd be looking at. And that's how you understand retracement levels. So from the low, how high, what percent does it go back up to the 100% mark? Because this is 100%, right? like so. And then half of this would be 50%. So then in the middle somewhere here would be the 61.8, 61.8. And why this specific number? Uh, look into it. It is a number that is uh, all around the universe. It's in flowers, it's in universes, it's in tornadoes, it's in charts. Uh, it's, it's really almost everywhere in the universe. Uh, definitely look into it. I find it very fascinating. And there's different ways of using the Fibonacci sequence as well. But this is just one of the ways to use it. So that's what we're looking for is we're looking for a pullback to reach around 50% to 61.8% back up to the high. That is going to be our main level of supply. Well, theoretically, this should be red. So let's, let's do it properly. So it should be uh, from the low from 61.8 to around 50%, we have drawn a red zone, which is going to be 61.8 at the top and then 50% at the bottom. And then it's gonna be a key level of supply where there's going to be sell pressure within this zone. And what we're gonna be looking for is a price action pattern around here that's gonna give us a, gonna give us a good edge to take a solid short trade. So hopefully you understand in a nutshell, what we're looking for, and we can now go into the actual chart and discuss 01, 2008, and what we could be seeing in the present day. So let's first go and talk about 2001, and then we'll go to 2008, and uh, we'll talk about the three legs that we currently have in the market. So let's just go like this and talk about the three legs initially. So you got your first major leg, which is going to be a high right here to right here first major leg, right? And then you get your pullback. And then from this high to this high, you get another major leg. And then you get your pullback. And then you get from this high to this low, another pullback. So what do you see, right? You see one solid push, oops, two solid pushes, and then three solid pushes. And then you see a consolidation, hold, 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 and then you get a break above the resistance, and then you get your trend back up. And this is major long-term time frame, right? But uh, in terms of market structure, you're getting three solid pushes. That's the structure of the market that you see right here. Now let's overlay our more granular details of what we are looking for. So we're gonna do the first leg right now. And we're gonna talk about it uh, one by one here, trying to not confuse anyone. So everyone is on the same page and uh, we all know what is happening. So let's get our white. So what is a swing high and swing low? That's basically what the question is, right? The swing high, actually we're gonna supposed to do a news article before this, but it's okay. We'll do the news article at or, uh, after, that's not a problem. Uh, so the swing high, we see that right here, this is gonna be the high 
of the stock market before it actually tumbled. So we know that's a significant high. And then we see it really move down quite aggressively, breaking minor levels of support all along here, and it broke right down. So that is going to be the first major push. Like I said before, we don't need to know the first major push, right? Boom, huge move to the downside from 1528 to 1150. Big move, right? So that's going to be the first push to the downside. We're getting a series of lower lows and lower highs. And then once you see the price start to shift, and then you get a series of higher highs and higher lows, okay, now we're looking for the pullback, right? So you see this low right here, and then you draw in your fib. This is the high, this is the low, this is the distance of the total retracement level we're looking for and then we see this number right here 618 and then right here if you see 0 0.5 this is going to be your key level of supply that you're looking to see the price hold remember the structure at the beginning of the video that we talked about a retracement back to like we said the 618 which is the top one or the 0 0.5 which is the bottom one and we see this red supply zone this is going to be where the sellers are going to be located like we talked about in the past. So that is going to be the first key place where we're going to see, and then that's going to be the supply zone. What are we looking for within a supply zone? We're looking for some price action pattern that's able to give us a reversal pattern. This could be, let's say, a double top breakout. You could even have a nice little retest and then a short down. You can have an ascending zone, create an ascending trend line like so. So you're getting a squeeze, you're getting a squeeze, and then it dumps to the downside. You could even have a head and shoulders where you get a move up and then you get a, a head or show you a shoulder, a head, and then a shoulder, and then a move to the downside with a nice little neckline there. Uh, there are price action patterns that we have edge trading, and that's what we're looking for in this right here what do we see well we see an ascending trend line but more importantly in my view we see a head and shoulders with a double left shoulder we see left shoulder left shoulder left shoulder right here one two you see a head at the top here higher than the all the shoulders and then you see a right shoulder here with a support resistance resistance support 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 break retest validating the previous support low and then you see it retest for resistance resistance twice and then you get a lower low and then you get the next move to the downside so these are the types of patterns you're wanting to look for you're looking for continuation uh not continuation, sorry. You're looking for reversal patterns against a, a very strong level of supply, right? So you're looking for head and shoulders, double tops, squeezing, something that's going to give you an edge. Uh, for, for us, at least, that's going to be what we talked about before. So that's going to be the first move, right? Perfect 618 to 0.5 supply level. It touched it perfectly at the 0.5. And then we got our failure pattern, our weakness pattern. Uh, so then the sellers could then come into the market. You could sell at this high, at this high, at this breakout. Uh, and, and those are some great entries. And then you have this whole move down here. Your stop loss is above the right shoulder. Fantastic risk reward parameters. Um, and we're not really going to get into the extensions too much, but uh, this is an extension one and extension two for TP levels if you were looking for it. Uh, 272 got hit pretty well perfectly right here. Uh, and then your second TP level, if you were looking for a little bit more of an aggressive one, would be 618. And primarily, you're looking for that next extension to this 272, and let's discuss that. And we'll talk about that within every other uh, pattern. So that's the, the first leg pullback, right? So that's going to be the first entry that we're going to be looking for that I, in my opinion, the SPX is having right now. We're having a pullback right now, and this is coming up soon. And this is... April 1st. So, you know, we're going to be looking for something along the lines of that, except we're going to be looking for a stronger pullback first. So that's the first instance where this has happened. Now let's look at the second pullback of this move, right? So we already talked about the first one in 2001. This is the major, and then we got our move to the downside and we need a market breath. The market moves in waves, right? Push, pullback, push, pullback. The market has to pull back sooner or later. So after this massive push to the downside, we got another pullback, which is going to be this thing right here, right? And then same thing, exact same thing that we did here. Where is the major market structure high? What well, went from bearish to bullish to bearish. So this right here is going to be the main lower high that we're wanting to use our fib off of. So this is going to be the 100% retracement if this is the low, right? We don't need to know exactly when it enter. We just see it 
come into fruition. We're like, wow, that was a huge push. And now we're getting a massive rally. That's a very significant zone. Wow, look at that. And then look at the most recent swing high. Well, the price was going from lower, low, lower high, consolidated, and went, and then it turned into higher, high, higher lows. Well, that's a little bit more bullish. And then it created our price action pattern and moved to the downside. So that's going to be the swing high. This is going to be the swing low. So we have a, a, a a circle here and a circle right here and the distance is going to be here full 100 retracement is going to be back up to here we got the 618 which is the top of this red rectangular uh, zone and then you got 50 percent, which is going to be the bottom of this rectangular zone right so same structure exact same system uh, that we are projecting onto the price action as the previous move to the downside that we got literally exactly the same right in terms of the structure of how we're going to go about this. The price action pattern will be different, but the structure should be the same. The criteria in which you're looking for opportunities should be the same. So what we're going to be looking for now is, yep, same thing, 50% and 61.8% retracement. What do we see? Well, initially we got a a pullback to around this zone. We see a touch here. We see a touch here respecting the 618 very, very well. And then uh, initially what I drew is this trend line, one, two, three, four, dependable zone. You have an, a double top with a break in an ascending zone. In my opinion, that would be a phenomenal, phenomenal entry in my books. And then you do see it actually come all the way back up. So I think in my personal opinion, what I would have done is initial stop loss up here. Once I saw the price get down to these levels, I probably would have moved the stop loss maybe up to this zone or even at break even. So I probably would have got stopped out at that point to be completely honest. I want to be honest with myself. Uh, if I did see this trend line get broken right here and then it moved to the downside, I would put my stop loss probably above that zone. And Lo and behold, uh, I probably would have got taken out, which is not the worst thing in the world. We can just then reassess the situation. We really want to see if I did get taken out right there. We really want to see the price hold below the 618, right? Which is going to be the high of the supply zone that we're looking at, which is going to be resistance, resistance yet again, another top, number, another double top resistance uh, at that zone there. And then we're looking for another price action pattern. Well, we saw the first move. And then we got halted. So let's say we lost that, which is not a problem. Traders lose. That's okay. Uh, and then we're looking for another opportunity. It's not like we lose and go pout and cry. No, we, we, we sit back and say, that's okay. That was a very managed, well-respected loss. I'm very happy with that entry there. If I take this 100 times, I'm probably going to be making money. Or I'm sure I'm going to be making money. So that's not a problem. I sit back, wait for the next high probability situation. What else do we see? We see resistance, support, 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 support. That major top rejecting right there should be the key takeaway that this is now a double top in my personal opinion. Once you start to see this, then you're looking for horizontal zones. It could be there. It could be that ascending zone that I drew that in my opinion is a little bit more respected than a horizontal zone. But at the end of the day, you're looking for that double top confirmation, which is going to break some level of support. So then you're looking for an entry at the low here, maybe at the pullback, maybe not. But regardless, you're looking for that entry in this particular trade. It really gave us an ideal pullback. This is that breakout zone and then we see a push to the downside holding that lower low structure forming a lower high previous support new level of resistance as well as a longer term double top formation is very very respected as well so in around these zones is going to be where you're really really looking to enter stop loss above here or above here and that's going to be your trade and also looking at extensions if you want to 272 is pretty well there 618 yet again has not been hit yet as an extension to the downside so that may be something to consider when we are looking for projecting opportunities in the future we may not want to use the uh next 618 we might just stick with the uh the uh 272 i'm just looking at uh something here really quickly i'm not logged into my binance which is a little bit worrying i don't know why um give me one moment all right so i'm good to go i'm back in the action so we see that uh this yet again respected our zone right we got the 618 50 percent supply zone to hold very well we got the double top we're looking for break of the ascending zone and then we fell yet again hitting our next projected potential take profit 272 right so these two structures is what i'm going to be looking for for the spx we just 
had our first push to the downside. So in my opinion, we have two major, major opportunities here for anyone who's actively trading in, uh, for example, futures or contract for differences, or even just looking to short the index with margin or even just uh, with, with cash or whatever. Um, these are gonna be some pretty strong pushes to the downside or if you're trading options, whatever the case may be, but this is gonna be a major market moving event uh, that I am potentially uh, looking for. Um, but yeah, this is how I'm going to be viewing this uh, upcoming uh, recession, basically, is, is, is this exact template. I'm going to extrapolate everything I can in terms of the criteria, in terms of the lessons, lessons I've learned, and then I'm going to project it on to uh, the current 2020 crisis. So that's 2001. Uh, I'm going to get a little bit of water, and then we'll go on to 2008. Uh, and we're going to use the exact same strategy, the pullback to the 618 and 50% looking for, excuse me, some price action pattern that will give us a bearish indication that buyers are weakening. And then we're going to look to short. So let's continue on in 2008, 2007, that total real estate financial crash. All right. So let's uh, make it so I can see. Okay, so I'm just uh, going to go like this. So let's talk about market structure and the, the three legs that we've seen in 2001. The first leg, the pullback, second leg, pullback, and then that full extension final leg that is kind of the capitulation mode. Uh, and we see that right here. This is, again, a double top. We see a, a resistance right here and another resistance. This is the high of the 2008 financial crisis uh, of the stock market. And then you see this massive push to the downside, right? Breaking key levels of support, really showing it. And then you see two resistances and then push down. That's going to be your first major indication that we are now in a bear market. Like 2001, very, very significant, right? And then we get our first pullback. Now, like anything, we're going to look for that 50% from here, 50% to 61.8, somewhere around there. And then we're looking for that ascending level of support like here. It could be a wedge. It could be a channel. But you're looking for a break, previous support, previous support, resistance, resistance, all that stuff. Looks phenomenal. And then we get our next leg to the downside. So hopefully you can see it by now. You got our first leg right here. You got our second leg right here. And then you got the third final capitulation leg right here. Like I said before, you do not need to trade the first leg. That is going to be your indication that we are in a bear trend. The second and third leg is where the money will be made, in my opinion. This is going to be the second leg right here. Boom. And then the third leg is going to be the total capitulation mode where there's going to be like like really, really blood on the streets. It's going to be scary for a lot of people. And I think that it will be necessary Um in order to just get so much of the debt out, um, there's so many zombie companies and corporations. And obviously, if you're just surviving off of credit and debt, um, you are not going to be a company that is able to survive this. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of companies that go under. And then the news topic that we'll go over at the end of this video will go over uh, some some more information regarding the potential financial crisis that is coming after COVID is completed. Um, but, you know, get into that later. So we've talked about the market structure in terms of the three legs we have in the markets. Now let's actually project our criteria and our structure and the game plan that we have for this upcoming uh, next two legs that we're going to have. So let's talk about the first leg we have right here. Let's go and take a picture. So this is going to be the first leg down and this is the first pullback right so this is where we're looking to get our entry at the completion of the pullback right so we see that the price made a low right here low and then second low broke a descending zone previous resistance new support you see a series of higher highs and higher lows you can notice that that is now a shift in trend so now we're making a trend to the upside you see an anchor point right here you see one two not really a perfect zone, but easily you can draw a trend line at that point. We didn't really get uh, any double top or anything. You can argue that that's a double top right there. But once you draw in that trend line and then also to coincide perfectly with, like I said before, 50%, 618 from the market structure uh, high, which is the all time high for the stock market, which is right there to the major low that we saw before the pullback. That is the two 
uh, swing high and swing lows that we're looking to hit, and that's exactly what we got. And lo and behold, what do we get? 618 and 0.5 right at uh, a level of supply. So what do we see right here? Well, we see an ascending zone, and we see a key level of supply hold the price from making a higher high. So we're getting a squeeze. We're getting a squeeze. Buyers are trying to push up, push up, push up. And then at a certain point, sellers are just saying, we're not going to let this pass. We will not let this pass. So there's someone who's going to have to to break, who's going to have to crack, who's going to have to give up and lose confidence, and someone's going to have to win the battle. In this case, we see a series of lower low, and then you see this previous support act as a one to support rejecting not what not just once but twice and then you see a massive bearish engulfing candle right after that second touch pushing it below the recent low as we can see yet again you have other opportunities you see another retest another retest and then you see a massive push to the downside so you got a lot of opportunity within that break to look for trades to the short side and uh, that's what we're going to be looking for so that is the first leg of 2000 or the first leg of no the second leg sorry the first leg that will trade it's the second leg altogether of the 2008 financial crisis. Very key that we hit the 618 and 0.5 and rejected immediately after. So out of the 2001 and 2008 financial crisis, the 618 and 0.5 has touched and rejected very well every single time so far. Oops, let's get that back. There it is. So that's the first major opportunity that we see in the 2008 financial crisis. And then this is the second one in the financial crisis. So let's look at this here. This is going to be a little bit different. Uh, and this is where there's going to be a little bit of a wrench thrown into our uh, criteria because we can see that the next, the final leg in the 08 financial crisis, remember there's the first leg, there's the second leg, which we can trade, and then there is the last leg, which we can trade as well, which is going to be usually the longest uh, final capitulation mode of the legs. So uh, right here, this is the third leg, because yeah, we have one, and then this is the second leg, and then uh, this is the first leg, second leg, and now this is the third leg. So we're now looking for the exact same thing. Where was the high of the swing high on the pullback? Easily noticeable right here. So there's going to be that 100% retracement. Where is the swing low before we got a pullback and a series of lower highs? Well, it's easily identifiable right here. And even within this range here, we can then say, okay, that's probably a significant low. Let's draw it in. And that's exactly what we do. So then a 100% retracement would be here. 50 would be right here. And then 61.8 would be right here. So this is the supply zone that we're looking for, right? And then we see a series of higher lows. Initially, I do draw, that was not a, uh, a well-drawn uh, trend line. Let's get it a little bit more flat. That was the initial trend line that I had drawn in. So then we were squeezing, squeezing. Uh, what I see in this is a nice, just bearish flag, right? A nice flag formation, a wedge, a squeeze, and then you get a move to the downside, a lower low, and then you get a one pullback, two pullback, and then you get a massive move to the dump to the downside, uh, breaking the structural low, making a lower low. You get a retest of the previous resistance as a new level of support, not just once, but twice before making probably the best trade that any short seller could make, really. That's a massive short. Uh, so, yeah, as we can see, it didn't go perfectly to the 50%. As we can see, the, the, the wick didn't actually hit the zone. So for the four opportunities that I have talked about, this trade actually did not hit the full retracement level, which is 50% uh, to 618. That, that supply zone, it did not hit it. But we still saw a nice price action pattern that was a continuation flag. And then if you were unhappy with this flag pattern, you also had another opportunity with a less aggressive, more conservative descending zone, or sorry, an ascending zone, where you have a touch right here, touch right here, touch right here, touch right here, and then resistance, resistance, and then you get a move to the downside. So you have a couple options there uh, that you could be looking for as a potential weakness in trend. But then once you see this support, uh, get broken and tested as a resistance, that in my opinion should be somewhat of a flag that you should be looking for shorts because that's a consolidation right here. It broke down the consolidation, made a lower low, held the lower high, held the lower high again, could not make a lower high for the third time. Come on, you should be looking to enter buy now in my opinion. So that's going to be the 
two legs that we're going to be going over for 2008 and 2001. Uh, like we can see, very structured. I'm projecting the same criteria for each of the legs that we're looking at, right? So um, understanding that, that you know, we have a we have a very strict, specific trade plan that we have, right? We've already looked at four of them, and on all four, they have worked. As long as we are really making sure that we are trying to find the best possible ascending zone, and we could have multiple entries like we had in 2001, we could get stopped out initially. We have to have the conviction to enter again, like we saw the second time in this in the third leg of 2001. So now that we've gone over 2001 and 2008, uh, eight. We can now go over this be massive behemoth of uh, 2020 here. Uh, so like the same thing, we are going to be going over basically exactly what happened and what we could be seeing from here. So the major supply zone that we have for 2020 is, we can see right here, is going to be around the 2950, so 2950 to around 2800, somewhere around there. And I'm going to draw it like so. This is going to be your 50% to 618 zone, right? Very, very significant. We can see the two lines right around there. We can delete that just so we can see the numbers very clear. So right now we did get a drop down. Uh, what I was seeing for a potential is seeing higher lows and then a holding of a resistance. This is a nice little ascending triangle on a smaller time frame. And uh, we did have a long here. I was hoping to see a nice little push like we saw in the previous pushes, but uh, we're getting a pullback. Maybe it's going to continue and hold this low. Maybe we're going to retest this zone. But in my personal opinion, I do think that I'm going to stick with my thesis this is the first leg down right so in my opinion this is the first leg down we're going to see it push to the downside we might test the lows of 22 22 30 ish somewhere around there but uh, that's my game plan I'm gonna be waiting for the price to pull back we're gonna be looking for some ascending zone to hold somewhere around there uh, and then we're gonna be looking for weakness from the buyers and then we're going to try to sell after the completion of the pullback right before the next impulse move to the downside. So yeah, that was a lot of information. We went over a lot of stuff, but I really hope that you understand why we are setting up the trade, how it is. Um, I know that it is super volatile and there's a lot of things happening, but um, yeah, you, you got to stay patient. Looking back at larger time frames is always a good idea. And um, yeah, I wish everyone the best, but this is how we, or this is how at least I am going to be playing the market. So I don't really want to be trading, you know, uh, a large position size, a lot of risk or anything within these zones, like even within this pullback uh, from the entrance here to have this high. I wasn't, I'm not risking a whole lot. The only times that you should be really, really going heavy, like th this was a counter trend trade which was a contrarian type of trade where i was going against the flow obviously it's super bearish uh so we significantly lower the position size so we have some exposure to the market if it does aggressively move to the upside but at the end of the day in my opinion i think the next major move where there's going to be money to be made in a significant amount of money money to be made is that next move to the downside here i think i just yeah move something so yeah anyways that is going to be the uh outlook on the SPX and then looking at extensions first extension 272 so from entries of you know positive of 2700 to the first take profit zone major extension is a 30% move yeah so that's like unleveraged imagine if you have leverage if you are on let's say five times leverage two times leverage um, ten times leverage you know like it, it, it is uh, a possibility to be one of the biggest moves that we could be seeing here in a very long time. Because um, obviously in the markets, it, state, it takes the staircase up and the elevator down. And this just shows the level of aggression that the market is selling off. There's more, like since 2008, there's been so much more algorithms coming into the market trading. And there's no you know, decision there made. It's an, it's an instant uh, input of numbers. And if the numbers line up to be 
a buy signal, it buys. It doesn't matter about anything else. It's so instant and it's just an algorithm. So these aggressive moves are going to get more aggressive because there's more algos uh, trying to scalp, trying to get that short term move to the downside because there's so much momentum that it's going to exaggerate the moves basically uh, because of these algos, these high frequency algorithms that are trading. And this is what we have right here. So in my personal opinion, there will be a time when we're going to have a stronger, more aggressive move that we will see from the S&P. So yeah, that's basically the, 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 the video of today. Um, not really going to talk about TVIX or the short term time frames because I did get stopped out like here because of the pullback. Not a problem. Um, I was expecting a little bit more of a, a push to the upside, but that's okay. We are still looking for that next big, big move to the downside. And um, that's basically going to be what we're waiting for. Uh, quick talk about the dollar index. Not a whole lot to talk about. Looking at the weekly, we're getting some hesitation. Uh, basically, all of my charts got scratched, so I have to go back to... Uh, just naked charts, which isn't obviously a bad thing, but basically on the weekly for DY, DXY, uh, we're getting a lot of hesitation, a lot of chop, although we did see a huge bullish push to the upside. We are holding that 103 uh, range pretty well so far. If it breaks above it, we'll probably get a lot of moves and a lot of bullish pushes uh, and a lot of buy pressure to push up above the zone. But as long as we're holding below the 103 range, uh, I still see this kind of consolidating and topping off as a potential just large term double top. And then once it does move to the downside, I think that there will be a lot of weakness in the dollar, fundamentally speaking. Uh, you know, not just technicals, but looking at how much they're printing. Um, it just, there will be a time when there's going to be a, a uh, not a lock, there, there has to be a question of confidence before a lack of confidence. And when the governments are saying billions and billions and trillions of dollars, like it's absolutely nothing. And this is, I think, uh, the first wave of multiple waves of QE. They might, they might not be calling it QE, but it's full blown out QE. Uh, and, you know, as time goes on, massive increases in supply for the US dollar is pretty bullish for uh, fixed or algorithmic uh, fixed assets like uh, cryptocurrencies and fixed assets like gold and silver that uh, you have to literally mine it out of the ground in order to get it. Unlike the central bank who can literally print it out of their uh, you know where. So uh, that is DXY and then we talked about SPX extensively today which is going to be the bulk of the video. Um, go look at uh, gold's video yesterday, uh, exact same situation. I'm currently not really looking to short gold right now. Silver looks like a better option, but right now we're just in such a tight, really perfect range. Look how like oddly perfect silver is right now. Um, yeah, I just don't really feel the need to be sh uh, entering any positions right now because we're right in a major, major level of supply. Uh, we already have exposure on a short on BTC, and right now, um, there's no real need to short, in my opinion. If we do see a pop-up and the price come to the 1450-ish range yet again, could be a good possible entry for the double top confirmation once we see the price validate this zone for a support or sorry a resistance multiple times but not much i'm going to be doing on silver and gold right now in my personal opinion a little bit more of a bearish bias on gold and also on silver uh also uh actually let's talk about that a little bit later so that's going to be gold and silver gold and silver ratio i'm not going to talk about us oil is actually holding a nice level of support right here we can see at around the 20 dollar range uh, it's holding a nice level of support, and this could be the support that we're going to hold for a f or finally a pullback here because we're seeing a series of a lower highs, which is squeezing the price, as we can see, squeezing the price closer to closer together. And now we're getting a, a break of this zone, which we actually just got recently. And uh, yeah, I think in the next global macro update, we might see a little bit of a bullish push here. The major market structure that we need to break in order for us to call it even a potential consolidation sideways is this zone because we can have a little pop up, a fake out, and then another dump down. So we want to ensure that we're at least consolidating. And that's not when we break the descending zone. It's when we break and hold market structure. So right now, uh, the first place that we want to break is the $22 range. If it does break that, then we're hoping to see a consolidation probably within this zone. So it's going to consolidate within this range sideways. And if we're going to be able to break the $25 range, we might be able to close that gap or come to the 28 ish range because we can see it's a key level of support turned into a key level of resistance so we got you know the mid-range zone here if we do get 
uh, from a downtrend to a consolidation by holding this $20 zone multiple times. We might get a little blip up from $25 to $28, which wouldn't be a crazy move, but uh, oh, let's get the arrow. Come on. There we go. 16% uh, move. Like, that's, a, that's a significant move. Uh, but that could be the next area of the retest of the previous support new level of resistance before the next move down. But yeah, I'm definitely still bearish on this because there's so much shit happening going on in the news and the fundamentals. But uh as of right now, it does look like we could start to see the consolidation after the $20 has held multiple times. So yeah, I think in the next couple global macro updates, we could see some level of a consolidation start and even maybe a pullback for the market breadth to take place. So we'll see how it goes. That's looking a little bit more, no, I can't say bullish, but less bearish. There's, there's a very big difference there. Uh, so that is going to be the global macro update charts uh we will get into the uh news article that we have for today right here all right so this is the discussion uh about covid19 going or uh, our current situation going from a covid19 health uh oriented pandemic which it currently is into a financial breakdown, a bank, uh, bank run, maybe, maybe not, but a financial breakdown uh, at, at the least, basically. So right now we are getting, yeah, the COVID-19 virus uh, breakout and pandemic, which is obviously very tragic for people who are passing away. Uh, but uh, this is going to turn into an economic, uh, uh, an economic uh, wasteland of, of just pain and suffering for a lot of companies. So uh, let's continue on reading here. American businesses are tapping their credit lines at the fastest pace ever, ever in history since credit cards were made. Banks made loans when the economy was good. What happens if their customers can't pay them back? So this chart is the commercial and industrial loans, all commercial banks, and this is the weekly change in billions of dollars. So this is looking like it's what, $1.75 billion. Let's read this article. As business activity jerked to a halt in March, American companies began using the credit lines they took out from banks to stay afloat. The chart above shows the week over week changes in usage of what's known as commercial and industrial loans. As the BCA research analyst commented on Tuesday's note that metric hits in highest level ever last week. Normally, rising business credit line usage would provide to be a boom for boon for bank earnings, BCA analysts analyst noted. But these are unprecedented times, they added. A clear risk for banks is that firms drawing on these lines may soon be insolvent. So understanding debt, understanding credit, understanding borrowing, one person's credit or one person's loan and another is one person's Debt is another person's assets. That's what I'm trying to say. So let's say I loan money to you. You now have debt. Another one person's debt and another person's asset. So the bank is holding all these assets because they are lending money to people, expecting to that expecting that money to get paid back, right? So in in their books, they theoretically have all these assets because they are hopefully. But they're, in their eyes, going to get paid back by the people borrowing the money. But this this is questioning uh, the risk of the people who actually borrow, the firms drawing on these lines, may not actually have enough money to pay back, may be insolvent, right? It's worth pointing out that it's not just the social distancing mandating the coronavirus epidemic that will weigh on banks. The collapse in oil prices in early March would have been enough to raise the frequency of defaults and likely outright bankruptcies. So yeah, especially America and Canada where, sorry, I'm just burping here. Excuse me about that. Uh, the America, in, uh, the, the companies in America and Canada have a very high cost to produce oil, $40, 35 somewhere around there and then opec saudi arabia 
as well as Russia, have much cheaper costs to produce barrels of oil. Oil, sorry. So these huge corporations in Canada and the United States are now not able to run their business at all. They're losing every single time they create a barrel of oil. They produce a barrel of oil because it costs them, let's say, forty dollars to receive it or to get it out of the ground and they can sell it for 20 bucks. That just does not make sense. So all these companies are now expecting either to lay off everyone and just completely halt um, or just continue losing money in the operation, which does not make sense, right? So yeah, huge bankruptcies. Um, and what do you do if, you're, if your business can't make money? Um, you, you, you go bankrupt, right? And then all these people are gonna be losing jobs. They're gonna be dependent on the government to pay them uh, monthly paychecks Where's that going to come out of, right? So let's continue reading. Still at BCA analysts low. In recent fiscal package, oh, sorry, the recent fiscal package provides some measure of optimism. They reckon that about $377 billion of the bill's spending will go to helping small businesses, which will turn help banks. Our sense is that policymakers will do more if banks start facing even higher losses, the analyst wrote, adding, stay tuned. So yeah, I completely agree. Uh, the banks will do whatever they need. They've already said they have unlimited money to try to stop this issue. They've already come out and said that. So we know what their game plan is. They've already dropped interest rates to zero. They can't do any more unless they're going to go negative interest rates, which is going to be very confusing. But you've already seen countries like Germany, Switzerland, Japan create negative interest rates, destroying the savers' bank accounts, right? And, and that's what there is left to do in terms of interest rates. And then the opposite side is just print more money, which they have no problem printing trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars and just dumping it into the marketplace. Uh, so yeah, this this is the uh, more fundamental aspect of it is understanding that right now we're in a pandemic. We're in a vi uh, the coronavirus is currently causing basically entire sectors to completely shut down. Tourism, entertainment, bars, restaurants, clubs, all that stuff is completely shut down. Uh, and, and right now we're just you know getting by. Uh, you know you know a lot of people are at home, not able to work, and. We're, I think, still talking about just this being a corona case. And you see policymakers like Trump say, we're going to bounce back better than ever. Uh, we're so strong. It, it'll, it'll be like no back. It'll be no time until we bounce back to the highs. And I just don't see that happening. I'm um, looking at like the, the, the total economics. It's not just a sector that gets impacted. When you stop one gear within an economy, all the gears are turning together. Uh, you know, the tourism sector goes to bars. They don't have that money to go to bars. They might stop uh, going to the gym and turn off their gym subscription. They might turn off their Audible and all these things. They'll try to save money and conserve, right? And U.S. economy is built up on consumption. Uh, you know, a, a good citizen, a good American citizen is to be a consumption machine because the United States is built on consumption. So when you have an entire generation start to save, well, the entire way of the U.S. economy is now completely halted. So, um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of trouble in terms of the the banks because they already have no uh, interest that they can that they charge, right? Zero percent interest rates. So you can't make any money. And, and charging interest is so little, then you got to start, you know, putting your money in riskier assets. And that's kind of what they're at right now. And uh, you see them, them lending money out to potentially insolvent individuals and companies. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty crazy time right now. Um, just to note, uh, I, I don't have a blog post on this, but the U.S. banks now are allowing 0% fractional reserve in their accounts in order to continue operation. So basically, anyone can be a bank. I can give you as much money as you want. You can spend every dollar of it and still say that you have it. And theoretically, at this point, they could have 0% of anyone's money and, and it's still 100% legal. So then it just begs the question of, Okay, uh, everyone's, you know, backlash on me saying, you know, what if the banks go under is saying, whoa, 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 the government guarantees their insurance. Well, where, do, where are they getting this money? Like if every single bank, let's say, not every single bank, but if, if a lot of banks start to go under, 
is the government going to have enough funds to cover all of it? Now, you say that the government has assets and funds safe in order for a potential catastrophe uh, to happen and then they have funds, but what if that they severely underprepared that fund to take on not just one bank, but five, six, seven major banks. I, don't, I just don't think they have the funds. And if they don't have the funds, they'll just print it, which is super bullish for gold, silver, and cryptocurrencies. So yeah, that is my view of the longer term time frame. This is a good, uh, I think, blog post to kind of understand where this is going from a pandemic into a financial economic monetary collapse uh, in my view which is very scary obviously uh, but uh, it's a very 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 interesting time so thank you very much for watching that was the global macro update is a little bit different from normal we went in depth into one chart and not really into the others but um, you know if we're looking at the charts every single day on the weekdays and we're looking at four hour and hour charts uh, it doesn't make sense to look at three candles that moved in a consolidation that we're not really trading anyways so sometimes doing these where they're informational educational uh, and they're actually actionable so you can actually do something with it like the the information that you gathered from this video uh, is an actual piece of information that you can actually draw on your chart uh, back test look back at it and say okay is this something that I would feel comfortable trading and that's our hope is we're not saying that this is the right way to trade we're not saying that this is the wrong or right way or whatever the case may be everyone has a different way of trading everyone has their own strategy but what we're trying to do is provide information that may add value to your already determined observation of the world, of the economy, of the markets. We're not trying to change your mind. We're just trying to give you unbiased information and provide it in a way that you are able to, uh, A, take without, you know, having uh, uh, me saying it's going to go down, it's going to go down. Like I have been saying it's going to go down again, but um, yeah, what we're trying to do is basically create a channel that allows people to get a different view of it without getting impacted by that view, by objectively looking at that information and say, hmm, do I agree or do I disagree? If you disagree, throw it out, uh, take off everything I said about the markets, 100%, that's not a problem. But if you agree, it could be an opportunity that could serve you uh, very, very well. So hopefully you got some level of education, knowledge, value from our videos if you found it useful please subscribe it helps us greatly and um, we really hope that uh, you're able to come in for another global market update uh, for tomorrow so thank you very much for watching and until next time have a good one traders